I work in Pro Tools and Tessa works in Logic. And so, um, <laughs> very separate. <laughs> so we're like thousands of miles apart, yeah. working in different DAWs. Yeah, but, but just like sending stems back and forth. Or you typically like one of us will kind of start a track and then um, the other will send their vocals, guitar yeah. parts, whatever. Like we, we hand off a lot of the things. Hello and welcome back to The Record Process. On this episode, we are joined by two incredibly talented songwriters. Their names are Winter Bethel and Tessa Mozarakis, and they've assembled their unique storytelling powers into the indie rock duo known as Tommy LaFroy. Tessa and Winter join us to discuss their experiences in the Nashville songwriting scene, the formation of this Tommy LaFroy project, and to dive deep into what it entails to truly be an independent band, all while unpacking exactly what went into the band's debut self-produced EP titled Flight Risk. The EP was pieced together over an eight-month collaborative period, and that period saw the two teaching themselves how to produce the songs they were writing and learning how to overcome the inefficiencies in a workflow that spanned multiple time zones and played out mostly over FaceTime. And despite these challenges, what they came away with were a group of songs that put on display not only their lyrical authenticity, but their brilliant combination of introspection and personality behind it all. And they share their story in their own words, coming up right after this. So many of the albums that we'll be highlighting this season on the record process share one very important theme. And that's the idea of technology helping musicians and creators overcome the collaborative restrictions that once came along with geographic location. Thanks to companies like Audio Movers, real-time remote audio production and the tools that make it possible are more powerful than ever. Their groundbreaking Listen To plugin allows you to stream, record, and collaborate on high-quality audio in real time and is used on a daily basis by world-class audio engineers and professionals at places like Capitol and Abbey Road Studios. Their new Pro Plan allows you to stream up to 150 users simultaneously, includes custom branding, and even allows you to stream MIDI data in real time. So head on over to audiomovers.com and enter the code RECORDPRO to get one month free off your pro membership today. So as you already know, we do a lot of talking about the creation of original music here on The Record Process. I mean, that's kind of our thing. But it can also be fun to put your own spin on an old classic and tell the world something else about yourself through something like a cover song. Cover songs can be a really interesting way to connect with your existing fan base or even a way to put yourself in front of new audiences through shared musical tastes. And our friends at DistroKid have made it super simple to upload a cover of your favorite song while allowing them to handle all of the back-end licensing work that can really be a headache for independent artists. DistroKid will notify the composer and publisher of its release, they will pay the necessary licensing fee, and they will take care of all the other legal red tape involved with releasing a cover song on a streaming platform, allowing you to fully focus on enjoying the process of putting your unique artistic spin on that recording. If you're already a DistroKid member, you can access this as you're uploading your track for $12 a year per song. Or if you're not yet a member and you'd like to sign up for DistroKid, you can use the link in our show notes to get 30% off of your first year's membership. Winter and Tessa of Tommy LaFroy, thanks for joining us here on The Record Process. How are y'all? We're good. We're good. Thank you for having us. Yeah. We're so excited. Yes. As are Tom and I, we have asked y'all here to talk about your EP, Flight Risk, which you put out in 2021, uh, November of that month. It's a great one. And things have just kind of, to say they've spiraled out of control, sounds negative, but it's actually quite a positive. So there's so much to go through. You had a bit of a viral smash on TikTok with one of the tracks. And there's, a, I mean, there's a ton of other stuff and people are liking it, it seems like, um, is is maybe the short way to say it, uh, Tom and I included. So let's let's start from the beginning, though. How did y'all get together um, and, and where did this project first begin? 
<laughs> yeah, well, um, we met in Nashville as we were both like working as songwriters. I was going to college there and Tessa was visiting to make writing trips. Tessa's from Vancouver, BC, yeah. and I'm from Michigan originally. Um, where I met Tom, which is crazy. Yep. Yep. Shout out Michigan. <laughs> Shout out Michigan. Um, yeah. And so Tess and I met in Nashville and we were like fast friends and we kind of, we wrote together because that's what you do in Nashville. Everyone writes with everyone. It's a very communal city in that way. And like, we were very much in the session circuit, like actively doing sessions, writing with all these different people. And yeah. so we wrote together like a handful of times, but it wasn't until a couple of years later that I sort of jokingly, like literally slid into the DMs. Yeah. And I was like, hey, <laughs> would you want to start a band? And um, we, it was just kind yeah. of a joke for a while. And in 2019, we started writing for it. Uh, but then, yeah, it wasn't until 2020 that we actually started like making a record and and producing out some of these yeah. songs that that we had written. That uh, so cool. So I mean, yes, obviously, I think you're uh, by moving to the city of Nashville contractually obligated to write uh, <laughs> uh, or at least like play guitar or some instrument. But um, I'm sure. So y'all did a lot of that. What were the because um, we don't talk too much about it. We've obviously had a, a number of songwriters, but it being that that's where you came together, were y'all met in sessions like co-writing sessions like that down there? Is that how that, that kind of came about? So you got to see each other's style and kind of, you know, work with each other initially before this project was even uh, a twinkle in anyone's eye. <laughs> yeah, I think we both had been writing songs for other people and like in sessions so much. Well, it's just like, it's a bit of a song factory, right? Like you, you just spend every day writing songs and often like helping other people tell their stories. And I do distinctly remember um, the first time I heard Winter play, it was at like Belcourt, which is like a songwriter. People play songwriter rounds and stuff. And I distinctly remember hearing her play and it just, there was something about it that just felt different. And I really resonated with everything she was playing. And I immediately just was like, I need to write with this girl. Like there's just something there. And when we first started writing, it was just like writing for the sake of writing, because that's often what it feels like you're doing sometimes in Nashville. And it was instantaneous though. We, we wrote a song so fast and it just felt different from everything I'd written before that. And it felt like it was a space where I could, just say what I wanted to say. And I wasn't really worried about who was going to listen to it, I guess. So yeah, there was like, we, when we met, we weren't like, oh, we're going to start a band, but there was definitely something there that we knew, we knew was there. Going back to the 2019 era before everything in 2020, was there a batch of demos or was there a batch of anything that like came up that you're like, oh, this is going to be such a cool record when we record it and we're going to get into the studio in March of 2020 and it's going to be great. And then like world ends. It was very yeah. much like that. We we kind of started writing for this secret new project in April of 2019. And we wrote some of the songs that ended up on Flight Risk, um, like Trash Fire was, I think, like the second yeah, song second we two. ever wrote together and for second or third. And so yeah very early on these songs just kind of came quickly and and so we felt like we were on to something but it was just like we kept it a secret for so long and then i ended up moving to la that summer um and tessa went back to vancouver and so while i was like living and working in la i was like working in a bagel shop doing like random songwriter sessions and then at night i would come home and like start working on yeah. these tracks um, but very like yeah. simple demos. We actually re-listened to some of them the other day and we were like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of a vibe because it's just so, so lo-fi. But like so <laughs> earnest. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were I was going to say, honestly, I, I, when's when's the when are the official demo uh, release, like demo yeah. B-side <laughs> release is coming? It's very in fashion, but I'm sure yours would probably be even more emotionally gripping than anything. Uh, I've, I go back at some of ours. I'm just like, that's just the song, but sloppy. Um, yours yeah. are probably um, a bit different as your songwriters and you're like, um, you know, uh, great singers and all of that stuff. But um, yeah, I love that. And, and so you've just been sitting on you had this like 
ooh, we've got something and it's, it's really good. So you kind of, you knew that, which I think is also interesting because of the way like y'all met you, like, I, I think about this a lot. And I think Tom and I have even said this, what's so different about this is when y'all had your kind of like Nashville meet cute, you got to pick your songwriting partner before you started a band, right? It, which is like, it's one and the same, but when you're young, you're just like, hey, your parents bought you a bass, mine bought me a guitar. Okay, cool, yeah. I guess we'll be in a band. We're on the same bus route. And you had that, like, you have no idea what that person's writing style or whatever it is. It's just, that's just where you land. But here y'all were able to actually take a look at each other and be like, yes, like I'm, I'm a fan of your writing style and what you're doing there. And then let you know let's form a project which i think is must have been part of what inspired you know such a great ep and everything that's kind of come along with it and so i just wanted to kind of earmark that for anyone that's listening that's a, that's not always how it goes and i think that's has a lot to do with um why this project has probably uh, been doing as well as it has right so i just love that so much so like y'all were sitting on these songs everything's good so what was like the like the kickoff from like, okay, we have these songs. I'm in LA. In Tessa, you were in Vancouver, right? Or where did you go to London at that point? Well, yeah, I see my my timeline at this point too kind of <laughs> changes. Yeah, so we were working on demos in 2019. And also when we started this project, we didn't picture ourselves producing it either. We were kind of like, oh, we'll like do the demo and sort of explain the vision and, and the sonic, you know, world. But, you know, in the end, we'll sort of work with someone who will bring it to life like we never really saw ourselves in the producer chair early on so yeah we were doing the demos and I um was trying to get to LA wasn't sure what I was doing because I'm from Canada so immigration is complicated (laughs) I had met this girl in a writing camp like in August of 2019 who was in the same boat as me and was just like I know a few people out in London I'm gonna go to London while I wait on LA or whatever's gonna happen there do you want to come with me and I just said, yes. <laughs> I was like, all right. So I I moved to London with her and we moved in February of 2020, Woo. <laughs> uh, which is great. Time. Hello. <laughs> yeah. And so I ended up being stuck in London on the other side of the world from my band member. Um, and I, I first thought, oh, I'll just go there for a bit. Maybe like, because also the London music scene is incredible. And, and yeah, I mean, I didn't anticipate staying for as long as I did, but it it really worked out in the end. At this point, I'm in London, and then and then that's kind of when we start producing a part because also we didn't get into like, any cool. studios when we were on the other <laughs> side of the world. Yep, uh, cool. So um, I'm six thousand miles further from you now, uh, yeah. and no studios are open. Let's start making this thing. Yeah. Okay, love that. What a what a predicament. <laughs> How did that work? What was step one? Did you just, did you, did you think about it? Did you strategize? Did you have like a whole, all right, here's the blueprint. Here's like, here's how we start doing this. Or did you just kind of get on the phone and we're like, okay, let's figure this out. What did it look like? We just like threw ourselves into it really. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a combination of factors. Like I, I went home to Michigan at the beginning of the pandemic and then got kind of stuck there because like all the flights were canceled out of the one, like there's like one flight a day out of the airport, you know, so they were canceled for like six weeks. Yeah. And Tess was in London and I was also like getting my heart super broken. And so there was just a lot of factors happening at once. And, and yeah, I mean, I think as, as we all experienced, especially in music, just this, like, what if we never get to do this thing like what if we can never play shows like what could we possibly do and yeah and I think for us like the music was all it felt like we had that we could like do something with and so Mm -hmm. um we started strategizing from I was at my parents house and Tess was in London and yeah kind of taking some of the existing demos I've been working on but mostly starting over because they're bad and um or were they when we listen when we hear them when you finally release them we'll be we'll let the public be the judge of those yeah we'll be the judge of that i work in pro tools and tessa works in logic and so um very separate (laughs) so we're like thousands of miles apart working in different dogs but but just like sending stems back and forth or you typically like one of us will kind of start a track and then um, the other will send their vocals, guitar yeah. parts, whatever. Like we we hand off a lot of the things. I think that's also why we're able to do so much in such a short amount of time because we are literally like we're 
multitasking in such yeah, a way that a tag team yeah we're both working on songs at the same time and then we'll just like switch oh so wow done faster sometimes I but think. in some ways i mean obviously that yeah. has its own set of challenges because it would be like <laughs> I wouldn't recommend this to anyone, <laughs> but she would be like programming the drums and I would cut the bass line and we wouldn't talk to each other about what it was going to sound like. <laughs> We'd Hell send yeah. it and be like, hmm, oh, maybe this works, maybe it I doesn't. I think you kind of got to work backwards and like Yeah, and, and with everything, um, maybe not every song, some of them, like one of us would go in more holistically, but there was definitely a lot of just chopping things up and sort of like, Frankenstein yeah, definitely this sound that we wanted but yeah we were fortunate in that we had the time I mean I also yeah. like got laid off in bagel shop <laughs> uh so but it was like I had some unemployment money so it was like that's literally what allowed me to make this record and like yeah. and us to be super meticulous about it it was just such a unique moment in time because we I literally couldn't leave the house you know so I spent all day just living in pro tools and and that kind of led to like shoot and the cause were some really early ones that we fully built out and then um but still even early on um we were still thinking we would like bring in someone to actually produce them yeah uh and then it wasn't until like September of 2020 or a bit later in into like late fall of 2020 yeah, really. that um we started sort of like bringing in a team some team members and uh like our first manager and we yeah and she was the one who was like you should just put these out and so we were like are you sure because <laughs> I, I think the other thing or just like a funny big part of our story is that we didn't feel like songs we yeah. just project that was like where we told our secrets and, <laughs> and then like what we sunk our time into because we just needed to feel something, you know, because of everything going on in the world and, and not being able to move or leave. Like yeah. um, it was very much just like a personal passion project. And uh, then we had to be kind of like convinced that we should actually put the songs <laughs> Like right wow. up until every release we're always like are you sure yeah. and we just need someone to be like yeah <laughs> so that's kind of been our experience with it you know what there is just too much uh for me to unpack in that the uh, first i mean where do we even start tom we're, we're talking two different languages cats and dogs pro tools logic <laughs> they made it work cutting drums and bass blind from each other and then throwing it together. And somehow you get uh, a seemingly uh, incredibly cohesive product that sounds nothing like the Frankenstein amalgamation that you were describing there. Mind blowing. And uh, and then, yes, you know what? Uh, leading that all the way to I think there is a bit of that self-doubt in every um, really talented, incredible creative. I think if it's not there, if you're like 100% ego, I can't go wrong, I think you're doomed. I honestly don't trust anyone that, <laughs> like... Yeah, I don't trust anybody that's 100% sure of everything all the time. That has psychopath energy written all over it. <laughs> But no, but but truly, and I love that too because I, I recognize that I know I know Tom does, um, and so many other like musicians and artists, even like the most incredible. I'm like, you can be in the studio and finish the most brilliant drum take or you know vocal take, and it's still like, was that okay? It's like, are you kidding me? We're in here weeping, and so I, I love that so much because it, it's a testament to the honesty, which is finally the last thing that there were no preconceived notions because there were no expectations. Where, and I'd love to kind of get into this a little bit as well, where when you're writing songs for somebody else, right, you're you're trying to think about their voice, their experience, what their fan base is, what their brand as an artist maybe is, because you want want to make sure it, it fits into that and it and it feels cohesive with it. But for this, it was just y'all. There was no it, for all intents and purposes, there was no Tommy Lafroy, you know, brand yet. You were creating it from the ground up. Was that challenging to feel like, hey, I can do this is my voice as a songwriter? Or did you already have parts of that from from ideas that you that you both had? How did that how did that kind of work? When we started this project, for me, it felt like a sigh of relief. Like I think when I first started writing with Winter, 
it was just like, oh, okay, no, this makes sense. And I can actually say what I've been wanting to say this whole time. I think I love writing for other people and I love helping them tell their stories, but it can be exhausting when you feel like there's just something you want to say and maybe they wouldn't say it that way and that's okay. But then I want to go home and be able to say it how I want to say it. And I think when we started this project, it was like, okay, there's no rules. Like we're just going to say it how it is. We're going to tell our stories. We're going to put as many Easter eggs and fucking names of people and whatever we can do anything we want. No one is telling us that we can't. And I think that was also very specific to the situation of like, oh, this is a secret. We don't know if we're even going to put these songs out. You know, like it's very liberating. So yeah, I think that's probably why the songs came out the way that they did was because we just intended to write them yeah, as totally. they were. And that was just like, yeah. I was going to say there's, there's really a freedom in that yeah. because um, we didn't even know what was going to happen. <laughs> we were just like wrestling this thing. And then, um, yeah. And with the production as well, we were very much like teaching ourselves as we went. I mean, I yeah. took classes in college, but it was like a minor and it was, you know, it was just like, I learned how to use the DAW basically. And um, I was still very actively like, how do you use a DS or like Googling <laughs> everything as we went. Yeah. And um, so, and as well, and this is something that we joke about now as we're trying to translate these tracks to like a live show is we, when we were just like making these in our bedrooms, there really were no boundaries. And we were trying to like make something sound interesting and also just like be, make something feel emotive. And so like, I wasn't thinking of any structural rules that like, because as songwriters, you work in the room for years with producers, like you get kind of like a front seat watching other people work. And a lot of people have a process, or at least with session producers, which is mm -hmm. a whole different thing than like mm -hmm. maybe record producers. But a lot of people have a process. Maybe they have like go to's. Maybe they have kind of this set of like, this is the structure of a song. And yeah. we were really trying to kind of disregard a lot of the rules we had learned in our time of like being session writers and because yeah we just wanted to make something that felt new and and more so just like served the song I think in production that's always my goal is to just um serve the song and make something emotive instead of you know whatever it doesn't yeah. even have to like hit super hard or like do it just has like to serve banger. the song yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were not trying to make bangers <laughs> Yeah. If you're an audio engineer or musician that's dedicated to creating and releasing new music consistently, then you already know that that process can be long, complex, and often expensive, especially while you're trying desperately not to sacrifice the type of quality that is crucial for your mixes to stand up to those big budget productions. Producer and friend of the record process, Jay Moss, has reimagined these roadblocks to quality that plague us all. With the help of world-renowned sound engineers, Jay developed an AI-based platform called Monster, which offers you the ability to quickly upload your song and receive a high-quality mastered edition in minutes, all at a price point that won't break the bank with each new mix revision. The platform also allows you to easily collect feedback from clients and collaborators, and it even caters to the perfectionist in us all by allowing you to quickly compare and contrast different iterations of each track as you make those final subtle tweaks. So for a limited time this season, you as a record process listener can not only try Monster for free, but you can also receive a 20% discount on your first membership by using the code PROCESS on their website at checkout. So hit the link in our show notes or visit maastr.io for more info. So a lot of people think that Oxford Pennant makes, well, pennants. You know, the triangular wool flag type things that usually have like a sports team's logo or the name of a place printed on them. Well, to be honest, that is what I thought too before my band The Wonder Years had the chance to work with them. Through that process, we realized just how much care they put into their beautifully crafted iconic keepsakes that remind us who we are and why we do what we do. They've teamed up with some massive artists in the process, bands like My Chemical Romance, Wilco, and 21 Pilots, just to name a few. 
and they even offer custom shop orders for artists, companies, and unique events or special occasions. So please do yourself a favor and head over to OxfordPennant.com and use the code RECORD15 to receive 15% off your first retail purchase from their web store. I have a couple of questions as far as this goes, because Tom and I always talk about, um, you know, going down the the rabbit hole that is like YouTube University, especially when you're um, talking about the the area of mixing production and like DIY, like home studio kind of tutorial stuff. Um, and I'm curious what that, cause you, so you said, um, like myself and, and Tom I had a, you know, background where I learned pro tools when I, I went to school at Drexel, but then I wasn't for like another decade until I started getting back into it, working out of studios. I had to go back and relearn the language. It was like high school Spanish. I was like, I know like three sentences. I can turn it on. I know it looks like this. Anything else that I actually need to know how to do, I don't know. So you kind of have to, A, refresh yourself on the language a little bit, but then B, you have to go, you know, you tip the scale and went all the way through into, no, like we're producing and going to ultimately mix these, right? Or did you bring in somebody at that point? And and what was the deciding, like, at what point did you realize, oh, we're not, ju- these aren't just demos, we're producing, you know, like uh, I, I if before I would have just left without the DSer, but now I'm going to go look and figure out how to actually uh, get this vocal to sit there. Yeah. So we did bring in um, we got some help with mixing, which I think was much needed, especially early on. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we had no idea. And also, I think our production process was really just diving in and really like my approach at least in regards to like youtube university was very kind of bare minimum i was just like learning what i needed as i went to just create and that was what i wanted to do and a lot of it was trial and error and and just like using <laughs> cracked plugins that our friends gave us oh, and like figuring no. out like, I don't know, tom you can edit it out <laughs> Deanna, <laughs> cue the ominous sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta cut. The, we gotta cut word. the feed right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will. We will talk more about this in our gear candy segment at the end, though, for sure. Now that you've said that. <laughs> no, but I think I'm like a huge student of YouTube University. Yeah, I think she's I'm like a the big video. Yeah, I think also because there's just in my like there's nothing I haven't been able. Oh no, I'm not gonna be like oh there's nothing I haven't been able to teach myself. But it's more that I can learn it on YouTube. Like all of our covers and stuff. Like I do a lot of Photoshop and all like video editing. I've been doing all of this stuff for ages, and a lot of it came from me just figuring it out and watching videos and asking friends and watching other people work. Obviously the best way to learn is by trial and error and just like being in the DAW and figuring it out for yourself. But there are just like, I think the base things like terminology and like shortcuts and things like that, that I'm just like, I'll just like watch a video. I watch everything at like 1.5 speed though. So we just yeah. There it is. Yeah, what we need right away <laughs> and move on. But yeah. Time is money, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for independent artists nowadays, of whom Tom and I work with a lot. I'm sure y'all did songwriting sessions with um, independent artists as well as, you know, artists and projects for labels. The kind of modern face of the industry is really predicated on uh, necessity being the mother of invention and figuring out what you need and kind of becoming in a lot of ways, a Swiss army, you know, artist. Um, And that's kind of what you're describing, you know, that comes at the peril of the feeling, you know, that plagues a lot of us where I think uh, it's very easy to think that there's just not enough hours in the day, you know? Um, But I'm curious um, because that that brings up a great point. Um, Y'all have kind of, almost like troubleshooting as you go, right? Whether it's, well, I need to now figure out how to do this very quickly to continue on in the process. I think that's what a lot of other artists sometimes get stuck on because they don't know whether it's, you know, okay, I can probably Google this, you know? Um, uh, but sometimes it's the things that you don't know how to Google um, in, where that like creative problem solving element comes in um, where it's a different kind of creativity. I think that's there, there's a bit of an initiative there where you're not just like, you know, how do there's there's more than one way to, to solve a problem. Right. Or to solve a problem that's maybe not even a problem, but say, hey, we can I can do this. If I learn how to use Photoshop, I can make these to accompany, you know, the visual narrative of this stuff. 
what what do you think um, that part of the process looked like for y'all? And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you've independently released the songs as well, right? Yeah, well, yeah. we work with distribution companies, but yeah, we're, we're definitely doing we do. doing it all. Yeah. <laughs> Doing it all. Exactly. So what is that? What does that feel like? Because I'm sure obviously a lot of um, artists and musicians, many of whom uh, are independent, listen to the show and are probably in a similar boat and wondering, you know, how you found it. And if there were any, you know, I mean, feel free to shout out your favorite, you know, tutorial online, you know, whether it's like your favorite, like, uh, you know, your favorite Pro Tools or Logic guy. It's like, that's okay, because I think that is part of the process nowadays that is really important. Um, but then also, like you said, you, you know, you pulled in some help at the end for mixing to have uh, a really calculated source of feedback at that part in the process. You know, there's, and I think that's the thing that I, I talk about with even a lot, like a lot of artists that I do some like strategic coaching with. It's not that you need someone to help you with everything. It's about identifying where you actually need help the most in order to keep growing, which is kind of what y'all did. Maybe you'll mix the next one yourselves. Who knows? But, uh, you know, I think that's an interesting uh, and a true sign of wisdom as an artist to know how much you don't know and when to kind of leave off. What does that decision process look like for yourselves? Was it just, nope, we're going to do it all? Or was it just try to do stuff until you can't, until you're like, well, we need a distributor. Well, we need a whatever, you know? I mean, because of the way that this project started, like in lockdown and we were so far apart and obviously like you're starting something from the ground up, there's like little to no budget. So it did come down to a lot of times of just like, okay, well, we can't afford to get anyone else to do it. We're just going to do it. We're going to figure it out. And it's worked in our favor in the sense that one piece of feedback, we get a lot. That's really nice to hear is people feel like the project is really cohesive. Like it's cohesive because we're doing all of it. Like it, it came from our brain and like the cover we do and all the ideas and everything like that. Like we're so in it. And I think maybe partly that's the producer brain of like, we are also big control freaks. So we really like to be involved and just like see what's going on, know what's going on. And yeah, it is a big thing of like, we are stressed a lot, but it's so worth it in the long run because I'm so proud of everything that we do. And I know that we, we did it. And like, we're there at the beginning, making sure everything is Tommy Lafroy and it is true to that. Like if we had a crest of sorts or, you know, like there's a sense of like, I think honesty or like we want things to feel authentic and true and for it to come across. I think we need to be as involved as we can be at like telling the story of the project. Yeah, so, yeah. definitely. Early on, I mean, yeah, I would say budget dictated a lot of decisions. Yeah. In regards to like the records, we definitely knew that we needed help with the mix because just, yeah, we had never produced anything like to completion before and so on one hand it was just like getting another set of ears on it to like and you know even it was kind of like it's okay <laughs> like can we put this record out and so we just needed someone else to figure it out as well just like our taste like the records were super like low mid-range build up like there was a lot of just like the stuff that needed to be just a little bit cleaned up and, and tailored so that there's just a tad of bit of clarity and and also I mean like this is kind of more a technical thing but something we found with the first record was like because of we wanted to use all this like dark instrumentation and like there is a lot of mid-range and then when we put them on DSPs because of the way it's compressed they we found our records to be quieter than other records which is something that like I, the mastering engineer working with on the next EP explained to us because I was like, why are our records quiet? So there were just all these things that we didn't know and we needed help <laughs> yeah. in, that, yeah. in that regard, especially with, with the records themselves because, yeah, to me, that was just like the foundation of what we we're doing and that was so important. And then everything else around it, like social media, visuals, that stuff takes up and huge um part of our time now and that stuff we really just had to like figure it out as we went yeah yeah was uh i guess talking about the instrumentation on was there anything uh like oh yeah we used this one guitar that had like three strings removed and it was it made this like really cool sound but like it kind of contributed to that compositional aspect that you're talking about that like everything was kind of in like this range 
of like low mid like was there any like instrumentation that on the ep that like maybe contributed to that but like is a central part of like the sound yeah so again yeah we obviously were recording in our bedroom so a lot of our drums like a friend of ours had given me like a pack of drum samples and that's essentially what i was using for a lot of like most of the drums on the ep and they're not like the nicest sounding drums because they're samples and they're kind of shit so a habit of mine is to just obviously cut a lot of the high frequencies to make it sound like lo-fi and like a little nicer to listen to but obviously because all of our drums had that a lot of our drums had a filter on them that obviously contributed to it feeling kind of like muddy sometimes or like quite low yeah we're just in that space yeah that was, yeah. That was a big joke <laughs> with the players gp was like oh drums sound like shit throw a filter on yeah. it like, well, it's just now, it's a like <laughs> now it's a choice uh <laughs> now it's a vibe <laughs> <laughs> I am having so many great merch ideas for y'all right now. Uh, I just sent one to Tom in the chat. Uh, drum sound like shit. Put a filter on it. That's great. Um, I love that. Also, um, low parentheses mid fi is maybe a Dude, genre I, that y'all and, and or a banner y'all might be interested in flying um, based on uh, the taste of the album. Yeah. I, I love. But also that is to say it's like. It doesn't matter, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, the songs were still incredible and they are their own thing and they were galvanized out of the taste preferences that you all had, right? And that's that's ultimately what's so great about it is like, sure, there's someone that will be like, this is the one unequivocal best way to, we'll go back to DSing a vocal. But then you can do it completely wrong and it's gonna have a sound and you can maybe really like that sound, you know? Um, so there's a, there's a way of, not just learning, you know, the technical, like, here's how you do it based on like this, you know, systemized, like academic checklist. It's also just, do you like what happened when you threw that on? You look at each other and be like, yeah, great. Then moving on, you know, yeah, um, yeah. which is, which is awesome. Um, and it's about telling the story. And as long as the story doesn't get, you know, too muddled by the low mid rate, you know, it's like, then, and then you're all good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, and I think also like um, having just limited gear, like we had limited, we had hardly any pedals when we started. Like one yeah. of the first pedals I bought was a Earthquaker um, hoof buzz pedal. And that dictates a lot of the tone because yeah. <laughs> it was the only pedal I had for a long time. Yeah. As well, I think that also informs choices with like the songs being so vocal heavy because it was like, okay, I know how to melody a vocal and I know how to sing. Like we, we both been like vocalists probably for longest. And so that also was like, okay, when we need to fill a space in a track, I know how to process a vocal, but I don't know how to, you know, do other things or I don't have other instruments yeah. or other, like even instruments in the sound bank. Uh, like, you know, I just was using a lot of Pro Tools stock plugins and stuff. So so I would definitely say that it informed a lot of choices that then very much kind of became the sound. And then it was like, okay, now our records are always going to have lots of vocals in it because that's part of it. And as well, our voices are really similar. And so we love to play with like weaving in and out. Like we're You're both singing everyone. on a lot of the tracks yeah. <laughs> um, together most of the time. But a lot of people, when we first put the records out, thought it was one vocalist. Yeah. But it's just a lot of stacks of both voices that we weave in and out and be kind of tricky with. And so, yeah, those were, it was just like leaning into what we knew how to do. Mm -hmm. And that very much informed the sound. And also we're big on uh, like iPhone recording in the sense of like one of my yeah. favorite things to do as, as a producer is just take audio from the real world. It's like my favorite thing in Knievel. We have, um, I like sampled taking the tube to work I like sampled it coming and going and reversed it and we have like voice moments of strangers talking on the train or things like that like it's my favorite thing to borrow from the world around me and put it in the song I also think it informs the story more too because then it almost feels like cinematic in a way because there's a complete other dialogue going on underneath perhaps or you know there's like so many other ways that you can build out a track and contribute to the story. It's kind of like sonic metaphors. I, they're like my favorite thing ever. Like if we're describing something that feels, that hurts, 
I want there to be a sound that is kind of jarring and that maybe hurts a little bit. And like in shoot, we uh, made it so that, you know, in movies, if somebody gets, there's a scene where there's a bomb or something, and then you have like a ringing in your ears, like tinnitus, Mm -hmm. we literally put that sound at one part in shoot because we're like, what if it hurts? And then we sort of create this feeling of like being hit by like an in, like some sort of big impact or something. Yeah, basically there's a moment where there's like a low pass filter on the thing <laughs> and then there's a like tinnitus sample. <laughs> like Hell yeah. yeah. That and is. Out, it like out. But yeah, I yeah. think it was just, it was almost like, I mean, you hear people say, I feel like new producers like overproduce. So maybe <laughs> some of it was like overcompensating. <laughs> we're like <laughs> feeling like we had no idea what we were doing, but we were like, let's just really make it throw everything in there (laughs) but love that but you know what i think there's a beautiful intentionality to it which is probably more important than anything i think that uh that idea that new producers overproduce, um, I think a lot of times they lose sight of serving the song. And if y'all are, are chasing those ideas in an effort to serve the song, I think that's why it, you know, it doesn't read like that. You know, it reads like something really creative and um, using some of those. I mean, I know Tom is a huge fan of sourced sounds from the wild, um, you know, almost in like a folly sense. But you are creating, I mean, in the same way that you, you mentioned, you know, how it gives it this cinematic feel, right? I couldn't agree more because if you look at like major motion pictures, the whole sound of whatever they're filming is stripped and everything is put back in in post. So you're kind of doing the same thing except there is no necessarily visual at the core. It's the song that is the scene and the story that you're kind of filming. So uh, it it makes total sense to me. And now what a cool way for everybody that if for some reason they haven't listened to this to go check out those moments. Um, Also heinous putting a tinnitus frequency uh, in there. I, I, I I feel like a lot of a lot of musicians, uh, especially in the louder rock discipline, such as myself, will take personal affront to that. No, no, it's just filtering out the audience. It's like if if it just sounds blank. Yeah. then Like you shouldn't be listening to us. (laughs) Then, yeah, then, yeah, then you got to go. Oh, that's amazing. That's such a cool, um, such a cool idea. Well, this has been, I I mean, definitely one of uh, the weird. I mean, I knew we were looking forward to this, but um, to say uh, that I've enjoyed it is definitely an understatement, and I, I can't wait to go back and re-listen again. Now having uh, even more context and background to it, but um, for now, what's next? Y'all have put out a new single, and and where do things go from here? Because there's there's some heavy momentum going. This thing is rolling downhill, and it might be tough to stop it. So I'm hoping you, that's not the plan. I, I don't think it's rolling downhill. I think it's rolling uphill. It's rolling You're uphill. Like, well, you know, yeah. depending on, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a rocket ship. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we just wrapped or are very close to wrapping close. the second EP, uh, which will come out this fall slash winter. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. This time we co-produced a few of the tracks with our friends, which has been so amazing because we get to see how other people work and we can all like learn from each other. And it's been, and they have proper studios, which has been great. Like we're talking live drums in a few songs. Like wow. we weren't able to do before. <laughs> oh, get out of here with the live drums. No, absolutely not. No, we were just actually a filter on it. Or... The, the cause I did record oh, uh, yeah. our friend Henry playing drums. Oh, and Henry we had the craziest setup. We were like in his office mm-hmm. and like this is i feel this is actually embarrassing i don't know (laughs) like snare mic we literally used my telefunken m80 like taped to an office chair and then the overheads i don't even remember it was just a very um questionable setup (laughs) stuffed into the drop ceiling just yeah yeah there was a lot of duct tape involved yeah Uh, but and then we doubled them with samples but yeah so we went from that to like being able to work with friends who have real studios, yeah. with like real kits, real mics. And yeah. because also um, 
Yeah, we did a lot of Flight Risk remotely. The next batch of songs we've been able to do together, but in a lot of ways we've had to strip down our setups because we've been, we're both living in London right now, but we're like living out of suitcases. And yeah. so we don't have all our gear. We don't even have monitors. Like we've yeah. really, really, it's almost gone like backwards, yeah. but we've just, um, there's been so much momentum that it's led to new challenges and like, how do we actually make the music? How do we find time? How do we find a space? Um, which is why bringing in some friends to help out and just let us like play in their studios and use their gear has been super helpful. Yeah. And we just borrowed a friend's studio for a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> it had no windows. <laughs> we, just, we just spent the last two weeks in a room with no windows. Yeah. You know, like 15 hours. Like all great studios, void of daylight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. By like day 12, we were turning into like little goblins. Uh -huh. like a full on <laughs> goblin mode. Yeah, well, full, on, full goblin mode, like <laughs> completely surpassed Studio Rat, and it's just like it's straight just, to God. <laughs> <laughs> studio uh, that's the next level ascension of Studio yeah. Rat. That's amazing. Yeah. A level up. Well, uh, yes, I, I think it's also to some degree true what you know that like it takes 18 months to write your debut album and then you get or like 18 years to write the first one and then you get like 18 months if you're lucky. That's not the case anymore. The cycle keeps dwindling. So that's extremely exciting that y'all are um, not only uh, about to have new music out, but also that you're pulling in other people with those new challenges because, yeah, now you're touring, right? Now you're like now playing shows is part of the picture, which it uh, certainly was not uh, at any other point early on. What has it been like then, uh, finally, before we go to play these songs for crowds? That's been like the reason that we do it at the end of the day. Like when we because you spend so much time in it that you even start to lose sight of of the thing of the purpose sometimes and like like we were saying a lot of self-doubt when we put out the songs we're like are these even good are people gonna like these and then to be able to play these songs for people who are screaming the words back at us has been the most incredible experience like and it oh it surprises me every time I'm, I just like I feel like I, I forget the words <laughs> but everyone's like it's incredible like I can't even explain like it's been so validating yeah i think we we started this as writers and yeah. and it was about the songs for us and when you're an independent artist and doing the thing there are so many things that take you so far away from the songs um that you have to think about and keep up with and being able to play shows and um having actually people come to the shows who know the words i mean we played a lot of shows and a lot of festivals where no one knows who we are but we've played a few shows where people really know the words and yeah. and know the songs and care about them more than we ever could have imagined and that has been like so incredibly rewarding and yeah yeah it's yeah. definitely and just being there for people in their moments like we've written a lot of these songs out of very chaotic very stressful times and like we were going through heartbreak we were moving away and it was like and we turned to a lot of music by artists that we really loved to help us through it and so to hear from other people that they've been listening to this record to help them through their own moments and tribulations or whatever we're all going through all the time because that is life it is that's also one of my favorite parts is just like being there for people as they go through it. That's amazing. It's a two way street, you know, and by playing these songs in front of uh, live audiences and people, it valid, it not only validates, but it also kind of connects and almost completes the circuit of like true uh, artwork in that own way where it's about eliciting a reaction, you know, and then, you know, realizing that they are there for you while you're showing up to perform these songs in the same way that those songs that you created were there for them. Uh, and, and on and on we go. So with all that, I, I wish you the best of luck moving forward on the new material. I, I, I think it's safe to say, Tom, I can speak for you uh, as well when I say we are very excited to hear it and cannot wait. And I guess we'll, we'll just have to have y'all back then, uh, at some point to talk, uh, to talk the next chapter, uh, of Tommy Lafroy, but thank you again for making the time and be safe. And, and we really appreciate it. And we hope to catch up soon. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. This has been awesome. Yeah, this is fun.
we often find ourselves discussing the events and situations that create the conditions for learning and growing and evolving as an artist. And I think it's interesting the way Tessa and Winter described their story and how their projects came together. There was a sense of shared commonality, right? They both had similar experiences as young, evolving songwriters, but they also were both presented with an unbelievable obstacle. And together, they chose to frame it as a path forward for Tommy Lafroy. They chose to spend the time that they were given during lockdown and during the pandemic teaching themselves new skills and strengthening their creative abilities. And above all, they chose to do the work of professional songwriters by getting in the arena, showing up consistently, and refusing to wait for the perfect conditions to present themselves. The origin story behind this EP is a great reminder that the process is not always pretty. It can be messy, chaotic, and often filled with a lot of uncertainty. But as long as you keep searching for a way to lean into that chaos and believing that you will, in fact, find a solution to the problems that are presented to you as a creative, whether it be on YouTube University or from a collaborator, that's all that matters. And sometimes that ambition and that belief in yourself is the only difference between an idea that stays in your head and one that finds its way to millions of listeners each month. I'm thankful that this episode found its way to you, and we'll catch you next time on The Record Process.